How you guys doing today? First day of Future Proof. Uh, we have Morgan Housel here, needs no introduction, author of The Psychology of Money, told me recently almost four million, pretty close to there. Great job on that. <laughs> and the first question I wanna ask you, a lot of people read your writing and they're just like shocked, like how does he do this? How does he make this sound so great? How does he have these stories? You've once said that 90% of virality is luck, right? It's like things that you can't necessarily control. So what do you do to maximize the other 10%? Like, I don't think people know about your writing habits or any of that stuff. I don't think you've ever kind of let people behind the curtain. And I kind of want to know that personally as well. I think, I think it's probably a combination of two things. There's a Steve Jobs quote that I love, which is, differentiation is survival. If you want to do well in any business, doesn't matter if it's writing or running an advisory, whatever it is, differentiation is survival. What's, um, my, what's so crazy to me about the book publishing industry is that books are very much like a seed stage startup in terms of even if you do everything right and it's a great book, it's really hard to get it to scale. It's really hard to sell a ton of copies. The huge majority of the of really good books won't sell that much. And despite that really low success record, most publishers want you to write the exact same book as all the other ones that came before it. They want to put you in a box of like, here's the formula, write it, the chapters need to be this length and a very like mechanized takeaway. And there's almost no appetite for trying something new despite a really low success rate. And so that's, I think that's part of it. You have to come up with like, and not, not even just a new book idea, but a new structure. Both of our books, like very short chapters, most publishers would say, no way, you can't do that. Your chapter needs to be 5,000 words. But I think it's totally wrong. So you gotta try something completely different. And the other is what I would call, I guess, like um, sustained passion, which is very different from obsession. A lot of founders and entrepreneurs be like, I wanna be obsessed with my work. And 99% of people who find obsession will burn out in a year, maybe two years. So to get good at anything, you need to do it consistently for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And the only way to do that is if you find a speed in which you're not gonna burn out, which is way below your potential. Like most people who do well over time are operating at 70% all the time. Like they almost never go to 100% because at 100% they're gonna burn themselves out and their relationship with their family is gonna start to suffer and then they won't be able to keep it going. The great Charlie Munger quote, uh, the first rule of compounding is to, never, is to never interrupt it unnecessarily. That applies to so many things outside of investing. It's like in your career, in your business, make sure you're operating at a speed in which you never have to interrupt that progress unnecessarily. Okay, so touching on that point, like you're doing things with stories, you're like coming up with these new stories all the time. Like what is like, you know, they say, you know, VCs have great deal flow, right? They're seeing the best companies out there and they get those companies early. Like, what are you doing to get the best stories? Like, I think the best writers have the best story flow. So, like, what are you doing to get those stories? Like, I mean, every writer spends 95% of their day reading. The actual writing part is not that much. And if you always have a bug in your head of, like, trying to find another story that can apply to investing, in my case, if it's always in your head, you see it everywhere. And then you spend your day reading about things that have nothing to do with investing. And... Every documentary you watch, you'll find a story that applies to investing, no matter what it's about. Documentary about Kobe Bryant, documentary about World War II, you'll find stories that are like, oh, that's how people think about risk in a way that applies exactly to investing. And once it's in your head, you see it everywhere and you realize how interconnected the world is. That the way people think about risk and greed and fear, the way that they think about it in investing is exactly the same way that they think about it in politics, in military history, in medicine, in health, it's all interconnected. And I think once you start looking for it, you see it every day all over the place. Uh, you've talked a little bit about this idea called the humble exits. And, and, and with humble exits, if you guys haven't read this blog post you wrote, he really respects people that go out on top, right? You can think of Jerry Seinfeld, you know, after he kind of went out when his show is like the number one rated show on television, right? And there's some people that kind of stay too long in. So the, the main idea is to quit while you're ahead. So why do you think people can't have a humble exit? Like, why do you think so many people end up kind of taking it too far and having this like kind of downward spiral at the end of their career? The Jerry Seinfeld example is the most interesting. So he, when he quit his show, it was the biggest, it was on top. And uh, GE offered him $100 million just for him personally, $100 million to do one more season, and he said no. And the reason he quit on top, he said, is because what made the show great 
was that he and Larry David spent all of their time just observing society. They would like go into a deli and just watch how people place their orders and they'd come up with a joke from it, just watching everyday society. But they became so famous that they couldn't do that anymore. He was so famous that he couldn't go out in public without getting mobbed. And once he realized that the thing that made him good was gone, it was diminished, he was, there's a quote where he says, the only way to know where the top is is to experience the decline, and he had no interest in that. And I, I just think that's such a, it's such a great, it's so admirable and it's so rare. Most people just want to push as hard as they can until they get forced out of their career, of their job, they're forced to retire, whatever it might be. And uh, I think for a lot of people, that's a pretty depressing way to go out. And if you can go out on your own terms, in your career, whatever it might be, I just think it, it's, so admirable to, it's so admirable to do that. I grew up ski racing, which is not a very popular sport in the United States, but it's huge in Europe. And in the last decade, the best skier, one of the best skiers of all time is a guy from Austria named Marcel Hirscher. And in 2018, I think it was, maybe 2019, he was, it was the best season he had ever had. And he was maybe 30, so he probably had about five more good years in him, and he quit. And it blew everybody's mind why someone who had so much potential would quit. And he said in an interview, he was like, I've achieved everything I want to, and I want to go hang out with my son now. And I just thought that was such a great, I was like, ah, oh, that's such a goal. And then there's so many other athletes in, in sports uh, who were great at one period, and they stuck around too long. And then their last game, their last competition is kind of like a sad exit on the way out. So I, I've just always really admired people that go out on top. Because I, I think, I'll say one, it's a form of having enough. When they're like, I've, I've, I've had enough success, and I don't need any more. I achieved my goals, and now I'm going to move on to something else. I think that's really cool. Okay, if you allow me to push back a little, like, how do you know you've reached the top until you've had the decline? Like, for all we know, like, Jerry Seinfeld could have been even more successful. It's hard to, like, you know, think that's possible, but, like, how do you know that you've reached the top until you start to see the other side on the decline, right? Yeah, I so I don't, like, it's true. If Seinfeld stuck around, the seasons probably would have been great for, uh, for a, a couple more seasons at least. So it's the people who are like, yes, I know there's tons of opportunity in front of me, but I don't need it. I don't want it. I'm just going to leave it there and go do something else. So I think by definition, you don't know where it is, and that's why you quit when things are still going great. Yeah. So Morgan has a new book coming out November 7th called Same as Ever. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Same as Ever is, I guess, Psychology of Money is really the psych, is about the psychology of you, the individual. And Same as Ever is really the psychology of like us, the collective society. So it's about things that people have always been doing and will always do in the future. What never changes about the world? And I think there's too much focus, not just in finance, but all over the place, on what's going to change. People trying to predict what's going to change. And a lot of the reason that the history of forecasts in the stock market and economics is so terrible is because people try to figure out what might change. When really what you should be doing, a much better way to think about the future, is what do we know for certain is not going to change? It's just an, in, an innate part of human behavior. So how people think about greed and fear has never changed. It was the same 500 years ago as it, was, as it will be 500 years from now. It's never going to change. People's willingness to listen to a good story and be persuaded by a good story, it was the same 100 years ago as it will be 100 years from now. It's never changed. And if you put all of your emphasis on what's not, what's not going to change, I think you have a much better chance of actually predicting the future and realizing what you know for certain is going to be there, then fooling yourself that you can try to predict what might change in the future. So it's 23 short little stories, very short chapters, about things that have always been the same in human behavior that you can count on will be here in the future. Are there any things that you've seen, when, when you were writing the book even, that you, when you're trying to talk about things that are never changing, or obviously finding you know, example, 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 are there any things that you found were like, hey, I found examples of these, but they did change. And were there any big things like that that you had to kind of cut out of the book while you were doing that? Was there anything I don't know, kind of like that? I don't know if it would, but there's been a lot of things that were very important for hundreds of years that then abruptly stopped. One of them I thought was really interesting is that in U.S. military academies, up until the early 1900s, one of the top skills that they would teach military officers was how to draw their own maps. Because if you're going out into a new territory, there weren't just a big collection of maps. You had to learn how to draw your own maps and like go out on the top of a hill and survey and draw your own maps. And then obviously with GPS and everything, in, overnight that just became a skill that didn't matter anymore. So it went from one of the most important skills to obsolete overnight. And I think there's, there's a lot of examples of that, of things that have been important for a long time and then stopped. So I think if it's something that's never going to change, it has to be not like a, a technical skill. It's going to be just a facet of human behavior. 
that's just ingrained in us. So how we think about greed and fear and whatnot. It's never going to change. It's always going to, it's just the lizard brain that's never going to change. You have once said that you never know uh, what sentence fell out of a writer's head and which sentence was agony when you're writing, yeah. when you're writing about something. Like, talk about that process for you. And like, do you think there's any way you, that you can tell that like, someone was, when you're reading someone else's writing, you can tell maybe they had more trouble in certain areas than others? I think what's definitely been true for me, you and I have talked about this before, is that good, good ideas are very easy to write and bad ideas are very hard to write. It sounds simple, but if you are struggling with writing, if you have writer block, it's probably because your idea is wrong. If your idea is right, most of the time it'll just fall out of your head and you can type it down really quickly. And so mo most writer's block is actually just bad ideas. And so knowing that, if, if, if the article just makes perfect sense and it's so clear and it's so easy, my guess is that that was actually pretty easy for the author to write. And if you have to reread a paragraph and like, ah, oh, what, what, what are they trying to say? I don't get it. There's probably an article or a book that the author really struggled with. That, and I, I, I see that with a lot of writers. If the idea is good, it just comes out instantly. It's super easy. I mean, are, are there any ideas that you've written about that you've, you kind of, you did publish them and then you said, you know, maybe I, I struggled more with that idea than a different one. And you, and you kind of maybe reformed it later in time? Because like, I know you've been writing for a long time. You've probably had similar ideas, and you've kind of reformed them I think, over I think time. early on, the intuition is if you're struggling with something, you can tell yourself, oh, it's hard because this is so deep, and this is so important. That's why it's hard to write. And it's, it's not the case. It's, it's almost never the case. So, so I think that was a problem early on, early on in my career. And now it's like if, if the idea doesn't flow instantly, you should just stop and pick up something else. OK. Uh, I want to turn the conversation uh, to something else where you talked about something called the social liability of money, where someone gets so rich and they start to realize that there's a lot more that goes along with that than just, just having money is great and all, but there's all these other things, whether it's other people in your life, um, whether it's charitable causes, the guilt, things like that. So can you expound on that idea that you had? I think I first started thinking about it. I did a thing uh, a few years ago with a group of MBA rookies, and we were talking about money. It was a private session, and MBA rookies, or all professional athletes, are a really interesting bunch because a lot of them grew up in deep inner city poverty, and then at age 20, they signed a $10 million contract, a $20 million contract. Like the abrupt, the, the contrast between it is so stark, and everyone knows the statistics that 90% of them or whatever the number is, will go bankrupt at some point. They have a three-year career, a five-year career, they spend all their money, it's gone, they're bankrupt. And so the, the discussion was about that. And one of the players, he was 19, raised his hand and he mentioned something I thought was so great. And he said, when you grow up in inner city poverty and then you make $10 million, that's not your money. That's your mom's money, that's grandma's money, your brother's money, your cousin's money, your neighbor's money. You can't just tell them all, I got my money, good, good, good luck to all of you. And so the social debt in that situation was enormous. Like you signed a $10 million contract and come with that comes $10 million of social debt. And social debt is not, it's very hard to track. It's not on your net worth statement, but it's a very real thing. And that's an extreme example, but I think that social debt problem happens to almost everybody. And I think there's, there is such thing as the ideal net worth over which money brings you no utility, but it adds social debt whether it's gonna be spoiling your kids, or you gotta start giving it away, you don't, you don't know how to give it away very well, or it just increases your own expectations of, of what the lifestyle you wanna live. And I think for most people, that number is different for everyone, but I think it's lower than most people think. The net worth at which above it is not gonna bring any happiness, but things start getting really complicated after that. It's probably lower than you think. Are there any signs that you know when you've reached that and when you're starting to go beyond that that you would think about? Like, for example, I was just listening to the Scott Galloway podcast, and he was talking about, you know, he reached nine figures a long time ago, and he still doesn't feel financially secure. And so it's like, he knows, like, objectively, like, yeah, I, I'm not going to have to worry about money the rest of my life. But, like, are there any things that, you know, you would see, like, okay, I've probably reached that ideal versus, like, oh, I'm now creeping into social debt? There's a great book by Harvey Firestone, who started the tire company, I don't know, 150 years ago, whenever it was. Uh, it's called Men in Rubber. And he talks a lot, because he made a, a ton of money, and uh, he talks a lot about what I would call social debt, about how he, a lot of the book is him like having nostalgia for how simple his life used to be before he became rich. And you can see how he's writing it, that he was happier back then than he is now. Patrick O'Shaughnessy, the, the podcaster, he talks a lot about most successful people, the way to describe their mindset is tortured. 
They're very successful because they wake up every morning and they can't think about anything else except the problem they're working on. And so a lot of people who become very successful, it's not this great, peaceful, easy life. It's actually like a tortured life. Like, I'd be willing to bet Steve Jobs was tortured every morning. He woke up every morning in some state of just anxiety and agony because he had this massive problem he's trying to solve that wasn't getting solved fast enough. Like, most of those very successful people are like that. I bet Kobe Bryant was the same. I think he woke up every morning pissed off about what he was lagging at in the last game. And so I think for, so those are the extreme examples, but I think everyone has something like that where if you get a promotion, you make more money, whatever it would be, there's probably some nostalgia where you look back and said, actually when things were simpler, I, I was happier. I think it's very different for everyone. This is not a black and white rule, but I think what most people want is a simple life. And there's a very good book that was written uh, in the early 1900s. The book is called The Quest for the Simple Life. It was written by a guy named William Dawson. And self-explanatory title. He was, William Dawson was, he was living in London, uh, in the city, and he realized that he was just so much happier when he went off to the country, to the countryside, and life was just so much simpler. And the key to happiness, William Dawson spent a lot of time studying rich people and how miserable they seemed to be. And that the people who were happiest, it wasn't rich or poor, it was the people whose life was simple versus complicated. That was the, that was the distinguishing factor. So I think there's a lot of people where their life will diminish, even if their net worth is increasing, if with that increase comes further complication in their life. Okay, so touching on that point, like, are, are there things that to look out for when that complication starts to occur? Like, is it like, oh, I'm noticing that like my time's getting ripped away, or I'm noticing that um, I'm not spending as much time, let's say, with my children, or I don't have as much control over my time. Like, are there any things that you would tell people to look out for? Because, I mean, everyone, you know, the, the, you know, John D. Rockefeller once said, you know, someone asked him, he was the richest man in the world at the time, and, he, and someone said, you know, how much money is enough? And he said, just a little bit more, right? And so it's like even the richest man in the world was, like, still pushing the goalposts. So the question I have for you is, like, are there any things you think people can think of or whether it's that simple life? Where does that, where, how much complication is enough, I guess, is the question I'm asking you. I think, like, everyone's desires are different, but what is so universal across cultures, across generations, that people just want control over their time. They just want to wake up every morning and say, whatever I want to do today is what I'm going to do today. It's up to you. You're not working for, your, your boss isn't going to dictate your schedule. Your clients are going to dictate your schedule. You're just going to do whatever you want to do today. That is so universal. And the problem with it is that most promotions or most starting a new company is going to eat away at control over your schedule. So there are CEOs who make $30 million a year, and they do not control one second of their day. From the moment they wake up to the moment they go to bed, someone else is controlling where they're going to be, who they're going to meet with, what they have to say, et cetera, et cetera. They have no control over their schedule. And that, that, I think, for most people would be a pretty miserable life. And the people, just like William Dawson showed, it's the people who have the simple life, who can wake up every day and say, I, want to, I can do whatever I want today, even if what you want to do is go to work and be productive. So having control over your time does, is not like, oh, the fire movement, like you're going to retire at 26. Most, almost everyone, what they actually want to do in their adult years is be productive in society. They want to wake up and go to work and solve a problem. So it's, it's, it's definitely not early retirement, but it's some sense of control. And it's so easy to overlook how much control you're going to lose when you get the promotion or when you start a new business, whatever it might be. Yes. Uh, you told me, uh, we had a private conversation, and you told me, you know, you had this one, you were taking a break finally. You've been are, are you sure you want to tell yes, this Yes, I'm going to tell this one publicly. Uh, you said, hey, I'm, I, you said, hey, I'm going to be taking a break in December. And I'm like, you were like really looking forward to it. T tell, us, tell us about what you were thinking when, like, tell us a little about that story. I've I think got, it's a no, great I've done story. I've several years in a row where I always say, I'm going to take the whole month of December off. Most people are checked out anyways. They're, they're getting ready for the holidays. So for the last five years, I've said, in the month of December, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit on the couch in my sweatpants and watch a documentary. And, and every year, I look forward to it so much. Like October, November, I'm like, ah, oh, December's right around the corner. It's going to be so, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to wake up and just relax on the couch. And every year, it's fun for about a week. And then in week two, I'm bored. And in week three, I'm depressed is basically what it comes down. And it's the same. But every year, I still look forward to doing it. Because I think it seems so intuitive that if you can just completely check out and relax and do nothing, that that would be a great life. Most people in the, in the fire movement, we'll figure this out the hard way too. Like they work so hard for this goal of retiring at age 27. And then after a month of doing it, they're miserable, they're bored. And I have, I have a couple friends who've been down this path too. I'm gonna to retire at 30 and play golf. No, you're gonna do that for two weeks and then you wanna go back to work. 
a lot of people now that we have much more uh, gracious uh, family leave policies, you know, a lot of big tech companies, even for fathers, can get six months paternity leave. And a lot of them feel the same way. After a week, they're bored and they want to go back to work. So what most people want to do is be productive in the world. Um, but having control over your time to do that, of when you're going to work, where you're going to work, what kind of work you're going to do, who you're going to work for, controlling that variable is massive to happiness. Yeah. And so I assume for you, that's like reading and writing. Those are the things you like, like to do. Obviously, you're writing a lot of books, writing uh, blogs, et cetera. So when did you, like, were there any signs that you knew, like, this is my thing? I think there's a lot of people out there who aren't sure, like, okay, I like doing this, but I'm not sure if I love it. Like, what's the, is there any sign that you're like, this is it? That's how you know when you found your kind of thing. Well, I started as a writer in 2008. And at the time, because the economy was a mess, and if you were a finance ma I graduated college in 2008. If you were a finance major, nobody was hiring. No bank, no, no fund, everyone was laying people off. So I took a job as a writer out of desperation. It wasn't like, oh, this will be fun. It was, the Motley Fool will hire me, and I need a paycheck. Never in my life did I want to be a writer or think that'd be cool. It was just, I need a paycheck, let's just try to do this. And I'd say for the first year, it just felt like a job. Like I was doing it, but it wasn't fun. It just it felt like a job. I think what became really interesting and when it started becoming fun is when I viewed it as not a financial writer, as not just writing about the stock market, but writing about how people think about risk and greed and fear. Because that just made it way broader. And if you're only looking through the narrow lens of finance and economics, it's not that exciting. And you can, there's only so many things that you can say about valuations and PE ratios and whatnot. But if you view it as, I'm gonna write about how people think that topic is endless. You could never scratch the surface of how deep that topic can go. So that's when it became fun, is when it realized like it was such a broader field than I once thought it was. And so also, how much of that is like, as you obviously got better at writing, you start getting admiration for your writing, how much of that is like even playing into that you're gonna keep going with writing, even though it wasn't something you chose like from you know, when you were a kindergartner or something, you know? So much of it was hard. I think it's less so today, but 10 years ago, writing online was so difficult because of the comment section that every blog had where people just fillet you and shred you to bits. And if you say something wrong, 100 people will instantly tell you in no uncertain terms how wrong and how dumb you are. And so for an, a young writer, it's so easy for your confidence to just be squashed every day because people just shred you all day long. But I think once, once, once you get a little bit of momentum and your confidence builds, then back to like differentiation and survival, if you have confidence as a writer, you can start writing things that other people haven't said before. You have more confidence to swing for the fences. Be like, ah, oh, this is a crazy idea, but I think it's true. Let's write it and see what people think about it. So that was, I think that just that low level of confidence, even just a little bit was, was really critical. How much of like, you know, reading the comment section, like, you know, you at least had the comment section to get like feedback and like people were saying things. Like there's a lot of people now they start out and there's no comment section, it's like silence, right? At least when, when I started blogging, like there was nothing, there was no one saying anything. That's how, that's, that's my version of failure is just complete quiet. Like if I had a comment section and people were like, you suck, at least people are still reading, right? Like that's how I look at it, right? So how much of it is like, is, is that what's going on with like, you know, as you get more popular, you're starting to, you're starting to see more hate and maybe that's what, the, what was going so on. So much, well. and this is true in any field. Like it's feedback from the people who you admire. Derek Thompson of The Atlantic has this good idea who's like, find somebody who is rooting for you but is still willing to be critical about your work. But, but is still cheering for your success. Most people in the comments section don't care about you or, or are rooting for you to fail. And that's, that, those are the people to ignore. So find someone in your life, like when you're, your spouse, your parents, your coworkers comment on it. That's who you should pay attention to. It's like Buffett's definition of success is when the people who you want to love you do love you. There's some version of that with content. Like when the people who you admire are commenting on your work, those are the people to pay attention to. So that's, I think that's, that's pretty critical. So you brought up Buffett's definition of success and you recently wrote a post about, you know, thinking about, imagining what your obituary is gonna say and kind of talking about I guess that version of success. Like, what, what's your version of success then, if, if given Buffett's? Yeah, this, this is actually a, a, an idea from Buffett. He said, a great exercise is to write what you want your obituary to say and then figure out how to live up to it. And most people in that exercise, if they were to, to write their own, like, what, what do you want your obituary to say? Most people would say, I hope that I was admired and loved and respected and a good spouse and a good parent and I helped my community, I contributed to my field. That's what they want it to say. And so then, okay, now figure out how to live up to that. 
But the other exercise is like the reverse of it, of what's not in there. And nobody in this exercise would care about, would even mention how many horsepower their car had, how many square feet their house was, how fancy their jewelry was. You would never, because you intuitively know that that doesn't matter. But what does matter is, are you respected? Were, were you a good spouse, a good parent? That's, like, that's the thing that you want. So I think it's a really good exercise to like, force yourself to figure out what matters. It's just, what do you want your obituary to say in the end? Okay, thank you for that, Morgan. Um, we have five minutes left, so I think we're gonna take some audience questions. I think the, we're gonna put them up on the slides and I can start taking them. So, okay, thank you, Slido. Give us a moment here. Nick, I have a question for you. Okay. I uh, was at a conference last week and they asked how I invest. And I've always been pretty open about it. I dollar cost average into index funds and my net worth is, is a house, a checking account, and index funds, more or less. Su super simple, and I really value the simplicity. And there are so many people, including this guy at this conference, who cannot accept that as an answer. And they can't understand why someone would not try to beat the market. And to me, my answer is like, I have no aspiration to. If I can earn average returns for an above average period of time, it's gonna achieve every financial goal and I have and then some. So it's just like, it's enough. And people cannot accept that answer. You're a data guy, but you also understand the, the behavioral side of investing. What's your, what's your answer to, what, to someone who would ask that question? Like, w w why would you not try to beat the market? Uh, my answer is just like, look at, like, w is that the thing you were suited to do here on earth? Like, is like, analyze stocks and beat the market? Or is there something else you can do that's gonna earn you far more money than ever that you would make, you know, earning in the stock market? And so you hear about these people that day trade all day, and let's say you spend 10 hours a week Right? Let's say you have, let's be very conservative. You have a $100,000 portfolio, you spend 10 hours a week doing this, right? And let's say that earns you an extra 5% a year, right? So if in a normal year, the market's gonna give you, let's just, I'm gonna be super conservative, 5%. So you earn 10% a year. So you're earning $10,000 a year and you're doing 10 hours a week times, let's just say 50 weeks, you take two weeks off for vacation, right? So what is that? That's 500 hours, $10,000. You do the math. That is not a great wage, right, in the, in the grand scheme of things. So, yes, it matters you can beat the market once you have a ton of money. If you have 10 million bucks, beating the market matters. But for most people, the math just isn't there, right? And so it's not that the skill can't be used later, but it's like there's so much going on there. And I think for me, it's like there's probably something else you can be doing that's a far better use of your time, and you're going to earn more actual alpha in terms of dollars than you're going to earn from your $100,000, $200,000, $500,000 dollars investment portfolio. So that's my counter, right? Right, if you're a hedge fund manager of billions of dollars, yes, every, every BIP matters, right? every basis point matters, but for most people, it's just not there. I think that's so, so good. Like the, the intangible cost of the time that you put in to managing money is huge. And for some people, like if, if it's, your, if it's your, your, your goal on earth is to be the best money manager, then that's great. But I think the huge majority of people just want to have enough money to live a simple life with their family, hang out with their spouse, hang out with their kids. That's the goal of most people. But there's so many people for whom that answer just doesn't click. And the idea that you would not try to beat the market is completely unacceptable, which has always been so interesting to me. Yes, okay. Um, so we still, I guess the Slido's still not up, so we're gonna keep improv -ing. Do you keep, have any keep more? Going. <laughs> keep going, keep going, keep firing okay. away. I have a question for you. Do you still hold 25% cash? I know this is something you talked about for a long time. Well, now I guess you can have treasury bills, right? That's, that's kind of earning some yield on that, but do you still, is that still your philosophy? I don't know if it's a philosophy, but it's probably something in that neighborhood. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's probably about that. I've always viewed it as, it's not that, I, I, I always like to save like a pessimist and invest like an optimist. So like save your money and have a level of cash at which you can absorb and manage and survive all of the unpredictable nonsense in the economy, but invest your money like an optimist. Whereas like if you have a higher level for, of cash, then the odds that you will be able to hold onto your stocks through thick and thin goes up. So everyone looks at a high cash balance and looks, just looks at the opportunity cost of that. But they're ignoring that if having high cash increases the odds that you will hold onto your stocks forever and not get forced out during the next bear market, then the actual return on that cash can be enormous. So much of investing is just how can you prevent a forced sale during the bear market? That's all of investing success. If you can do that, you're all set. And I think a higher cash balance does that. And if you're only looking at the dollar amount of opportunity cost of you could be investing this in stocks during a higher return, you're missing what the purpose of cash is. Okay, everyone, thank you. Thank you, Morgan Housel, for your time. Um, I appreciate everyone coming out. Please stick around. We have a, a lot of great events the next few days. Um, feel free to walk up to us. If you ever see us, we're happy to chat.